This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Janty Yates. How you do, Janty? Hi, how nice of you to invite me. I'm very honored. Thank you. I'm honored to have you on the show. As I was telling you earlier, I think you are the officially first costume designer we have ever had on the show and a heck of a costume designer to do that with after almost 500 episodes of the of the of the show i am uh, i am honored to speak to someone of your caliber and artistic uh skill because i've been a fan of your work for a long time probably the first the first time of course i recognized your name was uh in gladiator uh a few years ago (laughs) i'm extremely doubly honored now to find that I'm the first. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for your compliments as well. So, um, so how did you get started in the business? What made you want to jump into this insanity that is the show business? Oh, well, yes, <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. It really is insane. But I started making clothes when I was like 10 or 11. And I never stopped. And I just went off to um, college and I did pattern cutting, dress design, dressmaking. And I started off thinking I would break the fashion industry. And that was not going to happen. And I started with wholesale fashion manufacturers. Hmm. And uh, that was just not my cup of tea. I was not the inspirational Alexander McQueen or... John Galliano, I didn't sleep under my cutting table to produce eight perfect outfits. I realized I didn't have that sort of quality. And also, you have to be extremely well funded unless you do sleep under your cutting table. Um, And so I then was living with an editor, um, Martin Smith, who basically steered me into the world of commercials and um i knew nobody in commercials and i was just literally putting myself out there with friends of his and working for no money being an assistant 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 and just learning one's way around and uh, happy to work just for no money i do have to say my boyfriend did subsidize me for the first <laughs> 6 months which was Pretty nice of him, I have to say. (laughs) Now, was there a film that kind of lit the flame of you wanting to jump into the feature world? Oh, no, listen, I was I could have done commercials all my life. I would have been so happy working with different directors, um, you know, three or four days or a fortnight or three weeks. I was so gobsmacked when I was um, offered just a half hour film for television and that was because um the costume designer who was doing it was ill so it was by default in fact and so just i was clambering up the sticky slope i think you could call it (laughs) and uh, basically i um then did a lot of television a lot of television series um and then did my first feature in mid 80s um i think that was was probably my budget was really what i'd spend on a good dinner now (laughs) (laughs) times uh, times have definitely have changed uh yeah i mean working in the commercial world uh when especially during those years when there were budgets, like major budgets uh, that, I mean, oh my God, they were massive budgets um, that you had so much fun. I can only imagine what a department like costume would have with a budget like that, even on a commercial. Well, commercials are like mini films. And basically it's like, I want this sky blue pink suit on this man and we're shooting on Monday and it's Friday. You know, it's that sort of hairiness. And Mm -hmm. so I was kind of quite glad to leave that behind after X amount of years. I was like, oh, what? I've got six weeks to do this film. How marvellous. Let's 
first two films I did. Oh, brilliant. Oh, lovely. Uh, just now, so when you were working, so can you tell the audience a little bit about what a costume designer does? You know, because I think there is a lot of miscommunicate, a lot of uh, misunderstandings about what you uh, actually do. Well, yes, we dress everybody on set, literally, from their socks upwards. And uh, whether it's contemporary or period or space, science fiction, we do it from beginning to end. Unless it's such a low budget that they've said, the director has said, oh, they can come in their own clothes. And then, you know, you always, always do all the actors, all the main actors. Yeah. It's only background that you'd let go on a, on a um, low budget crowd scene that they, you know, and then they'd say, well, don't, we don't want red and we don't want yellow and we don't want primary colours or we only want red and yellow and blue <laughs> and primary colours. Usually they'll say that when they've all come in beige, you know, <laughs> but uh, a bigger film, then you get more chance to, um, to construct and you have more time to do the research, which could be upwards of a month or six weeks of research. And then basically you start your cutter and he or she cuts and you make prototypes. Then your actor is um, with you for your first fitting. Then you take photos and the director throws it all out <laughs> or doesn't. <laughs> Hopefully he accepts it. <laughs> but you've got your brief from your director. So I'm talking, you know, Basically, everybody from leads number one, two, three, four, five, and six, right through. We have about 185 actors on this film I'm doing at the moment. Um, but they're possibly, you know, just one will be saying, nominee Patris, da, 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 you know, and it's one outfit. But they're all, all costumed by us. It's and, quite and responsibility oh i could i can only imagine and then it also is all themed do you have a whole kind of idea i mean obviously depending on i mean if it's like in the martian when you worked on obviously there's the martian costumes and then there's the back in nasa uh, costumes uh so they're not together but you there is a color theme there is a a general theme throughout um throughout the the uh the movie itself because even in some of the I mean, if you look at something like Gladiator, um, there's definitely a theme within all of the costumes that you've created. Because you could have gone one way or you could have gone another way with the, with the theme of the thing. So it is all kind of cohesive, if I'm not if I'm mistaken, correct? We always have, um, basically, we always have um, a big meeting with the DOP, who at the moment is Darius Wolski. Um, with Arthur Max, the production designer, and with Ridley. And he will set the tone because he's a painter and he was at art college for seven years. He went to the Slade and the Royal mm -hmm. College of Art. And he goes down to his hut at the bottom of the garden at Christmas and he just paints, which is wonderful. My whole room is papered with storyboards, which he does ad infinitum on every film so you know exactly what's in his brain and basically you have to really go by his storyboards because he's got a complete vision mm -hmm. a total vision and um, basically no having said no reds you know reds yellows <laughs> and blues nothing primary is really he's because he's a painter he loves, he loves old masters. He loves the feel of a painting. And so it's that you veer to, the feel of a master, a Bruegel, or, you know, a George Latour. You know, you will, you will go to that direction rather than just here it is, the red dress, or, you know, here it is, the blue dress. So a lot of it is guided by Ridley. And we just truck along. 
<laughs> now, how did you meet Ridley Scott, and how did you guys become um, the collaborators that you have? Because you've done a couple movies with him at this point. <laughs> One or two, one or two, but you're only as good as your last movie. So never assume, never, ever assume. Correct. And frankly, you know, I basically um, was doing a film with his son Jake. in Prague called um, Plunkett and McLean, which we thought was the most fabulous movie. And I still believe it is the most fabulous movie. And he'd come in. And he'd say, oh, my dad was watching Rushes at the weekend. Well, now, I've had a huge hero worship of Sir Ridley Scott for decades, you know, mm -hmm. decades, decades. And I go, oh, I'm sure he's not, you know. I never really believed Jake. Mm -hmm. And because there was, you know, he was in L.A. and Jake and we were all shooting in Prague, I thought, oh, I'm sure he hasn't seen them. You know, this was back in 98. Mm -hmm. um, however, he did. And he um, he stole from Jake, uh, the makeup artist, me, the steady cam operator, and uh, the second second um, second unit director. So he really, them off the top, as it were. <laughs> Jake is a great commercialist. Jake is a very very lovely and very creative guy, and uh, he never minded. He wasn't making movie after movie like his father was. He mm -hmm. was quite happy. That's so that's how, so that's how you guys got together. And it was was your first collaboration with Ridley Gladiator. I know. <laughs> no, you did that. But you did a couple movies before that, right? No. 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 Why me? I don't <laughs> know. But, you know how blessed was I? It was. It was incredible. You know, just the fact that we were making tunics down to the knee to look like oh Scottish God. kilts. Yeah. Um, I was running around um, the helmets that we had. I was making sure that the brims, or they're not, they're actually um, hit blockers, that they were on the end, of, on the edge of the helmet to look like a, a baseball cap. Right. And they were just really trying to make them look cool. Rather than, you know, if you look at Trajan's column, which is the best place for research, actually, just standing in front of this column, it has acres of legionaries just marching around it, all carved beautifully. And they all have short skirts. They all had, they just didn't really, it didn't really work. So we just cheated a little bit sure. on, their, uh, on their legionary um, uniforms. I mean, because, I mean, that film alone, you had, I mean, between the iconic now gladiator, you had these multiple gladiator characters who had their very distinct look, like that silver with the uh, the teardrop of, um, oh my God. Tiger, such, yeah. yeah, all of those amazing costumes. And you also had the legionnaires. And you also, so it's like almost two completely different worlds. And then you had the commoners and the peasants. And this is your first big movie at this point, correct? Completely. And I really was guided through it by my supervisor, Rosemary Burroughs. Um, you know, I didn't know where to go. We interviewed so many different um, special effects costume makers. We, you know, we luckily prep was delayed because of some reason. I can't remember. But we it grabbed us another month and a half, which was terrific. Wow. Um, but we had... We had the German, the barbarians, the Germans. We had the Praetorian Guard to mm -hmm. design. And, you know, it was very, very exciting. It really was but terrifying. <laughs> I was talking every single day of that entire prep and shoot. It was terrifying how do you how do you research a project like where do you find your inspiration for the individuals like from i mean for something from like the gladiator to the martian like there's said that's such a you know or, or alien there's so many different um or prometheus there's so many they're so different where do you go to find inspiration per project and how do you what's your process in um gladiator you just walk around rome <laughs> You know, because every single statue is either a legionary or it's Caesar or it's, you know, Augustus. It's extraordinary. Obviously, books, huge amount of books. Ridley um, 
came up with the most wonderful inspiration for the crowd. He wanted Alma Tadema, who painted, he was a late 19th, no, sorry, late, he was 1980, uh, not 1980, 1880 to 1910. He painted wonderful Roman scenes. And we used a lot of his paintings as inspiration. Um, obviously, the British Museum, the Ashmolean Museum, um, just museums, a go-go, libraries and artists and Rome. And then really, for the Martian, Ridley briefed me that he wanted similar to Prometheus. For Prometheus, he'd said, we want skinny suits. We want them to be body hugging. And we were ahead of the curve there. We, you know, there's been a lot of movies since which have nicked our ideas. <laughs> but uh, the great thing about um, um, the Martian spacesuit was that really it was Ridley again who just said, I want orange in it. I want it to be silver and orange or gray and orange. So we just worked with that and we just worked and worked and we added and we took away. And it was, you know, a whole host of um, trial and error until we came up with it. And the uh, the helmets on Prometheus, they were a work of art. They mm -hmm. had the recording for sound. Um, we lit the actors and we had 11 monitors with tech running on them constantly. Batteries a go go just drove everyone mad placing the batteries. Um, and obviously they had to breathe, so we had to, you know, pump air into their um, into their helmets, and uh, also for not fogging up. So we were doing a lot of, you know, really quite ground ground, ground excuse me groundbreaking uh, work on on those. Now maybe they'd do it all CGI, but CGI was around. Um, we just did it. Practical is practical. You know, there's something about practical. Human uh, human beings can feel it. Uh, yeah, Alex. It's, I mean, yeah. enhancing with visual effects, even in clothing where there's capes and things like that and other things that they do in visual effects that can maybe add to. But even then, you can't replicate. Even with as much amazing technology as we have today, it's hard to replicate reality. Yeah, yeah. and all those capes are usually on fishing wire. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Two men either side, out of screen, obviously. <laughs> pulling, <laughs> pulling, exactly. Pulling. Exactly. Not, not the most. Uh, not Thank what you, you think about. Yeah, not what you think about. Where you're like, oh, there must be something high tech. It's fishing wire. It's fishing it's wire and a dude in a corner pulling. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Two. Two, two generally generally two um now so you've worked with ridley for for you know for the better part of two decades now what is his approach to costume design how does he approach i mean because we know he has a vision i mean all his films are so visual and he does storyboarding he is an artist a painter how does he specifically approach the costuming of his characters within um within the projects let's say the last duel his one of his latest films how did he approach that well, he's very visual. He's very visual indeed. And uh, he he is a huge collaborator. And um, he will, you know, he will come up with ideas. He was the one that found the most wonderful effigy, um, which we stole the front of his cuirass to make Adam's um, battle armor. In actual fact, Adam's battle armor he just ponces around him. He doesn't really do much battling. He's just, you know, mm -hmm. he's just there being Pierre's right hand man. And he he it was wonderful. It was gold circles on each breast and a gold circle in the middle of the cuirass. Um and Ridley found that. And so we went with it. And, you know, I basically I'm just a facilitator. Yeah, and then just basically whatever really comes up with you, like okay, and obviously it's a collaboration. You're, he's asking you for your ideas and your input, obviously, on how to to put it all together. But I mean, imagining, I mean, working with someone like Ridley Scott, who is so 
specific yeah about yeah. his vision um yeah. there is, but there's still obviously room for collaboration i mean you obviously are throwing ideas at him he's either batting them away or or agreeing with them absolutely and um you know we we do go backwards and forwards but he for example he's done every single scene in this film that we're collaborating on at the moment um in a store in a storyboard and i noticed that he had josephine because we're doing napoleon in a red dress in a red setting and so i questioned him on that and um he said yes he wanted a red dress well we were doing josephine different colorway um but we made him the red dress and he went that's fantastic so you know, you could never really tell, but basically his storyboards are the Bible. They really are. But we always we always get together and um, work out the colours. I sat down with Arthur Max a week ago and we went through all the sets. And, I mean, we're shooting entirely on location. But he, he always shows me through, says, well, what do you think? Should we redo the drapes on this bed? And Ridley won't necessarily have any input on that, but he will, you know, he'll comment if the drapes are wrong. Um, and, you know, he'll comment in time for them to make new ones at, say, a four-poster bed. Right, exactly. So. He's not going to do it on the day of. <laughs> um. <laughs> Generally speaking. <laughs> Generally speaking. Generally well, speaking. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know, but, I mean... He did this on Gucci. He, um, LG, I came running down with LG. She had this red dress that we'd made, another red dress, for, ironically, that we'd made um, for eight weeks. We'd been making the toile, fitting it, making it in the fabric, fitting it, fitting it again. And then we run down to the set. It's supposed to be when she meets Maurizio for the first time and really went what's this and uh, I said well, it's the red dress and uh, he went oh, I want to see her legs so we put her up on an apple box and thank god she brought her wonderful man from New York who did the cutting because I would have just gone like Zzz. we <laughs> took 18 inches off the hem of the dress to make it a knee length dress oh my so, god no hemming, nothing. Just it was like Burr. with five camera crews all standing around, drumming their fingers, you know, <laughs> like chewing gum, waiting for us. Oh, it's, that must that that. I mean, I can imagine that's a little bit of, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of stress. I know it's roll with Ridley. It's called roll with Ridley. He'll say <laughs> he'll say something like on the in the court of Ramses the third. He'll go. Well, it's red again, actually. He's, he'll say everyone's in white and gold and, you know, there's lots of clerics and he'll say, I'd, uh, I'd like something red. You're just about to shoot on maybe those 10 clerics. So it's roll with Ridley, you know, really. And you're, and, and you're always locked and loaded just in case, I'm assuming, at this point uh, in the game. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> You figure it out. You figure it out. But that's what makes. I know. I know. But you never know what he's going to come up with. And it's <laughs> all like, what? Okay. Right. I mean, I remember on The Martian, um, Matt's just sitting in a park and 20 students jog past him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went, why haven't they got any baseball caps on? Okay. And so I just went around the crew. And we were, black, you know, gaffer taping out. I mean, that's just a day in the life of costume designer. Blacking out the Nike signs, you know, just beanie hats. Yes, I'll have 10 of your beanie hats. Camera crew, four. You know, oh, that's amazing. Throwing them on. Because it was supposed to be New York. Or no, America, anyway. Exactly. Now, can you talk a little bit about the power of color? in the work that you do and the emotional attachment that we have with color and, you know, what red kind of means, what green kind of means, or is it basically just whatever, you know, Ridley is feeling that day? Is there, but I mean, obviously red has a very different distinction than blue or green in a dress. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about that for the audience? Well, he basically, um, he only goes to red usually when um, it's involved with something quite personal, something mm. fairly maybe sexual, you know, it's sort of, it's the naughty woman will wear red. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that um, LG wore it was because she was kind of on the hunt, even though she was very innocent and young in that time, early, early days when she seduces Maurizio that night on the dance floor. Um, he's not very keen on brash colors he's not keen on um on um what's the word um when you can see them at night um, neon neon loud well, exactly exactly mm -hmm. he's not keen on um those sort of colors he prefers the colors of an old master he loves grays browns beiges he loves all those all those tones. Loves navy blue. He loves blues of all colours. But um, it's all dependent on the setup. All dependent on you know whether it's contemporary or period. Everything is pertinent to the set. Now on a, on a film like The Last Duel, which I just I just recently watched a few days ago, and you know I have to say there are very few directors left working inside the Hollywood system that can paint with a brush like Ridley does, that has given the resources to paint these large, on large canvases, which are not based on a superhero or a major IP or Harry Potter or something like that. I, I, I could probably count them on one hand, <laughs> in one or two hands, how many of these are left. Um, what was it like working on, on the last duel in this? I mean, because you also worked on the Kingdom uh, of Heaven, which is also a massive yeah, medieval yeah. medieval. Uh, pro how was it like working on, on and last duel? And how did you specifically question? How did you handle the mass amount of people and battle sequences and and clothing, you know costuming all of those? What's the process? You did. <laughs> Yes, you basically, you have a wonderful wardrobe supervisor who um, I have in Italy and we get a lot of costume from Italy. Um, they just look after the street people. They look after the upper class, the middle class. Um, obviously, the, um, the battles were, they had to be really in full armor so mm. that was that was a problem we rented a lot of armor because we couldn't make for every single soldier you know there's no way we could afford that because it was bad enough just getting the 12 or so out for each of the um, of the leads so they basically they did work we had one or two maybe five or six in actual metal but most of it was urethane, which is, you know, the go-to fabric of making armor now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was that taken care of. The duel, they were all upper class along the, the top. Um, most of them were actors, so we, we designed them. Um, I mean, it's a very, I could just, drone on about it you know from where, where everybody everybody's costume came from you know the king we had embroidered um in uh, chalk farm north london for example right. and so and the queen you know everything i really could i could sort of write a book about where everything came from you know so so on a on a project that big you know because most filmmakers listening to the show will never be able to play at that kind of you know that kind of color palette is there very few people that can do that what is the process of just literally the actual production process of clothing on a day one everyone's call time is five o'clock in the morning okay we've got you know a thousand extra 500 extras 250 extras is everyone going through a tent and just basically almost like a assembly line getting fitted for the for the background and things like that and maybe on a battle sequence 
where we're going to see on screen at one time maybe 500 to, a, you know, not 500, but 100 people at a time. Because I know a lot of it might be added in post to make it look bigger. But I know from what I've read about Ridley, he likes to do as much in camera as possible. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And we fit them all in advance. Okay. So they all come in the day of shooting. They know exactly what they're wearing. Mm -hmm. It is literally a production line. They come into us, they get dressed, they get, then go on to hair and makeup. They go there, and then after they're out of hair and makeup, they go to the armorer, let's say. Um, we're talking soldiers here. And also, there's a huge amount of stunts that are used um, now in, uh, in battles because they're more useful, frankly, than... Uh, just having extras who can ride. Um, so they have their own tents. They have, but it's exactly the same production. And the same with the um, civilians. They literally will come in maybe at three or four in the morning. Not mm -hmm. quite as bad as Gladiator, which was 1.32 in the morning. Um, <laughs> But we had three thousand there. So was it was it really literally three thousand people that you guys had to? to call? Yeah, yeah. We had three thousand in Morocco for one of the smaller battles, and uh, then three thousand um, a day in Malta for the Colosseum for four weeks. I think for three oh my of the. God, I can't. I mean, I can't even comprehend on a production of that magnitude, that's just the people, let alone feeding the people, let alone clothing the people, let alone bathrooms. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I, it's, it, it, it it's, is, it's a huge moving circus, you know, it really is. But we've always fitted them before. We've mm -hmm. fit them, you know, up front. And basically they know what they're going to wear. They know what they've also visited hair and makeup before, so they know they're going to get a, you know, a shock of new hair or, you know, makeup. double eyebrows or, you know, great big bushy beard or whatever. And uh, so they know all of that. And there's no surprises, really. Um, and they know what arms, because the armourers always deal with, you know, however many there are, 200, 300, 400. They deal with them and they hand them out, you know, when they're actually on set. As for feeding them and Lou stops, then, you know, there's huge, great tents of catering, huge, great honey wagon <laughs> that just go on as far as the eye can see. Basically, no other productions are around you at that time. They basically have taken all the honey wagons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> now, I mean, you've had the pleasure of, of collaborating with, Ridley for the last you know couple a couple decades you must have been on set multiple times watching him is there anything that you can see on because there it takes a very special director to be able to orchestrate on such a large scale you know it, it you know Ridley doesn't make private movies in a room uh, <laughs> that's not he doesn't make the one location film that's not what Ridley yeah. does yeah. What did you? What do you see in in working with him all, over these years? That is a skill set that he has that allows him to continuously not only do this once every few years, do two a year. <laughs> do, do, it's insanity. How does he? What What is that thing you see in it's him? Madness. It, it really is. It's just madness. He's a complete fiend for work. Mm -hmm. You know, I've spoken to him over Christmas, and he goes, "Oh, I'm just going down to my shed to paint." You know, I can't bear this hanging around, nothing to do. You know, he's a complete, he's a fantastic workaholic. But what I never, ever will understand is how he can position five cameras and get right. it done. That's what I can't understand. I can watch him work and I can see his brain working and he's mapped it all out beforehand, every shot that he's going to shoot which is extraordinary. I mean, that's extraordinary in itself. But the fact that he handles these five cameras so calmly, he and the DOP, who's um, Darius Wolski at the moment, um, you know, they just handle the camera crews so gently and so 
you just put yourself there and you get this close up and you get the mid shot. You know, they just do it, I mean, X amount of times a day. And very often he'll finish early because he's got everything in two takes. He's a miracle worker. He really is. Yeah, I, w- I was going to say, because to be able to shoot at that scale with that kind of canvas and with that kind of just humanity <laughs> that you have to deal with sometimes, especially like on The Last Duel or even House of Gucci, there's so many people you got to deal with. I've heard that he shoots five cameras at a time. That is a master. That's a master at work. Be able because to be able to light four or five cameras, be able to move and capture everything. It has to be able to move quickly to be able to and efficiently to be able to work within these budgets that he's working within. Well, absolutely, and I think um, Darius works. They work very well alongside each other, and they've got it down to a really, you know, it's a fast pace. Um, it's fantastic and he moves on he beats the schedule sometimes <laughs> he he's ahead of schedule sometimes on some of the most massive projects going on in hollywood <laughs> but he's confident in what he's got that's the thing you know it's I amazing mean, he I knows mean, I- what he what he wants right exactly because he's been i mean he's gone to war so many times i mean he made his first feature at, at i think 40 but before that he had shot five thousand commercials five thousand probably six thousand exactly <laughs> he he was a past master even before he shot you know the duelists his first right. ever feature his yeah it, it, it's remarkable master. now all these years as you've been working is there ever been a day, and I have to believe there has been, when there's a day on set where everything in your department, something has gone wrong, the world is coming crashing down around you, and you're like, oh my God, how am I going to get out of this? And what was that moment and what project, if you can tell me, and how did you overcome it? Or does it happen every day? <laughs> it happens every day. Are you serious? I mean, how... A- a costume designer can just sit at their desk and let everything go on around them. I'm on set all the time because Ridley will come out with, well, we're going to have a couple of horses. Can we just get a couple of grooms and, a, you know, maybe a child on the back of the horse? It's something like that, you know. Oh, OK. Running off, putting out fires all the time. You know, he he's just he's inspirational. He really is. And you've just got to roll with it because otherwise you lose your mind. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't he doesn't get what he wants. So you're facilitating him as much as you possibly can. You know. And I mean he understands if you haven't got that sky blue pink suit, you know, over the weekend, that's fair enough. He understands that. But he's um he's a very tight taskmaster. He keeps you on your toes, he, but he inspires constantly. So what's not to love? And when you were – so when you were on that set of Gladiator and that's your first big movie, which I can't believe you were thrown into the deep end of the pool as your first feature film. I mean you're basically working with um, a living – I'd done a lot of features before but never anything of that. Right. With Ridley. Yeah, you've, yeah you had work on features. Oh, huge budget, huge, and then for it to have the success oh that it God. had, was unbelievable. You know, it was extraordinary. But no, I had done, I had done some features before. No, no, yeah, I know you've, I've done, yeah, but nothing at the scale of Gladiator and being kind of tossed into your, into the deep end with Ridley. I mean, I have to ask you because I always love asking anyone who happens to win an Oscar. What was that whole experience being in that hurricane, the center of the storm like that, being on your first big monster Hollywood film? What was it like? Well, it didn't belong to me, the Oscar. It belonged to my entire team. Sure. You know, I had four different companies making armor. I had, you know, even from the drivers for everybody in Morocco, everyone in uh, in Malta, I think there were probably, you know, 200 people that, that Oscar belonged to. And uh, my assistant and my supervisor, I didn't feel worthy of it, to be honest. 
Really? And it just kind of like, <laughs> I couldn't, it must've been, it must've been surreal. It must've been surreal. Well, it's like nothing else. That whole weekend of completely feeling like a princess. And, you know, I didn't, there's no way I was going to get it. You know, the fact that I got it, I was completely stunned and speechless. So that was, that was extraordinary. But I wanted to thank everybody. You know, every, I would have stayed up there for an hour listing everybody's name because I didn't feel it belonged to me. Now, uh, I have to ask you, you also worked on another film uh, that just got released uh because really releases a movie a week apparently, uh, House oh. House of Gucci. When I saw the when I saw the trailer for that, I was like, oh my god, the costume designer must have had a ball diving into the archives of Gucci of all <laughs> companies. Yeah. What was it like? How much fun did you have on that project? I had so much fun. It was great, and basically they opened the archive, but the archive was moving. Um, and they were stalling us, and we finally got to see the archive. Mm -hmm. and there were only about 20 outfits, but they um, allowed us to ship them over to LG, and she fit them all like a glove. They were fabulous. And um, we actually then, this was October, we fit her kind of, I think, in January in LA, and then basically or maybe it was December, anyway, it doesn't matter. Then they, when we started shooting towards the end of February, they released them and we kept them in a strong room in the hotel we were all bubbled in. And so we basically, we knew that they fit and we knew that they looked great. But Patrizia Reggiani didn't wear a lot of Gucci because it was kind of a bit conservative. She liked Yves Saint Laurent, she loved Dior, she loved Givenchy, etc. So I was so lucky. I found Torelli, and they had the most wonderful archive. Also, Animode and Ferrani, they had archives as well. But it was, you couldn't see the other end of the room. It was just, because I was thinking, where am I going to find all of this costume that I need for LG? Because I had a cutter, and he was making the most wonderful stuff. But I needed the archive as well and I found all of Dior, all of, uh, of Givenchy, all of Yves Saint Laurent at Torelli. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. So I was very, very happy and you know LG would come into a fitting and she'd go, that's what I'm going to wear when I meet Maurizio or this is what I'd like because we'd all have all the stuff that we'd made as well. I, my cutter started very early. And so we'd have a lot that was just punted to fit her, and then we'd have to obviously alter. I mean, I mean, and Lady Gaga is essentially a, essentially a fashion icon in her own right prior to being here. So I could only imagine having her almost as a collaborator as well, like going, "Hey, I want that. Hey, I think this would be good." And let's ask Ridley. <laughs> she was great. She was so collaborative and so happy to. But she would never, ever wear the same outfit. She had 54 different outfits. She would always say, right, that's it, that's done. And we'd pack it away with the earrings, with the three necklaces, with the bracelets, with the brooches, with the handbag. We'd pack it away and it would never be touched again. Wow, really? So sitting somewhere in a warehouse? <laughs> no, it's actually in L.A. Oh. It's over your way. I think MGM... Um, I think they have it at the oh. moment but everything else for example the 40 suits i made for adam and the 15 20 suits i made for al pacino they're at the moment in a warehouse in rome because they're embargoed until the film has come out well now last week it came out so mm -hmm. we'll be sending those all over to mgm i guess i guess <laughs> You're too busy on Napoleon right now to think about things like this. <laughs> I guess, yeah, because normally you get you get a year off, you know, you, you know, between projects. So you're like, oh, maybe I get six months off. But I guess working with Ridley, you don't get much breaks. <laughs> well, this has been extraordinary. You know, I think um, what happened because I knew about 
Gucci a year before we actually started it. Mm -hmm. And I was sent the script. I went to the the museum in Florence is beyond fantastic. It mm -hmm. really is the Gucci Museum there. And I went there and I crewed up all my Italian crew. And then we didn't do it that year because Matt rang Ridley and said, well, I've just written this script with Ben. Would you like to shoot it? And he went, yeah. Would you like to shoot it now? Because we're all free. Yeah. So, you know, that just came like a missile out of the blue. Okay. Again, the, a, sh a small little independent film that Matt wrote, Matt and Ben wrote. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like... It came along, you know. It wasn't a small little movie to like sneak in between House of Gucci and something <laughs> Well, in point of fact, because COVID happened. Right, there's uh, that. We shot um, six weeks in France, in medieval France. And then we thought we were going to Ireland to shoot the rest of it. But no, we were all sent home from Ireland. So that... Slow things down. That was COVID, yeah, that was COVID. But MGM reached out to me and said, would I like to do six to eight weeks on research and development of Gucci? During during our lockdown, yes, please, thank you. <laughs> so we did a huge amount of uh, research. Yeah. That was terrific. And and it shows on that. It shows on the uh, on the screen that you had. You would would you have gotten that much time prep on a movie like Gucci, or did, was COVID allowed you a little extra time that you wouldn't have normally had? No, I think I'd have probably been asked to do research and development anyway. Mm -hmm. It might have crashed. Mm -hmm. But I had to get my cutter to start early um, because we were just dancing in the dark measurements wise. We hadn't sure. filled everything up with um, LG. Mm -hmm. So thank goodness the MGM head of physical production um, said, yes, he can start early. So I might have been just asked to do that research and development then. Who will we'll never know, will we? Never, we'll never. Well, listen. After COVID has changed everything for everybody on the planet, mm. uh, so it's we'll never. There's a lot of we'll never knows of what if. There's a lot of what ifs of what exactly. exactly. <laughs> now, I um, I was um, I was working at a, a local food bank, um, mm -hmm. and I was just happy to actually earn some money during lockdown. That was great. <laughs> exactly. Now, that sounds so callous. That really sounds so callous. <laughs> I was very happy to get my teeth into Gucci. That's fantastic. Uh, now, what advice would you give a costume designer or uh, that wants to kind of break in, uh, someone who wants to get into your uh, kind of line of work in the business? Well, I knew nobody, absolutely nobody. And uh, my partner at the time was an editor. And he said, he pointed out, you know, commercials and little films and things like that they all would need costuming i went really i didn't know that <laughs> never knew and i mean that's how naive i was but i had been to college and i had you know done my time so i basically worked for anybody who'd have me i did stills i did um you know an assistant 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 working for no money, literally sort of, you know, virtually washing stockings and ironing skirts and doing anything that um, they'd give me to do. And um, gradually I'd sometimes be asked back and be given a small amount of money. So really it's get yourself a basic training and persevere. Be as nice as you can because that helps that you get asked back. Never say no. <laughs> right, right. I always carry a notebook, and if you can't think of anything to do, iron something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a bit. so. Look busy is what you're saying. If you can't look busy, yes. look busy. wow, that Jan, she looks. She's working hard over there. We should bring her on the next show. <laughs> now mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests. Uh, what is the lesson that has taken you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry? Or in life? Well, <laughs> I've trusted people terribly 
and made terrible choices. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really still always believe the best of everyone. And mm-hmm. I'm getting more and more cynical as I get into my olden age. So I think really I would just say, you know, always give people the benefit of the doubt, but only three times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Only three times. Not, not just once. Three times. So you're not that cynical yet. You're not that cynical yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, and what are three of your favorite uh, films of all time? Oh, well, um, Lawrence, of course, mm-hmm. of Arabia. I just still, I watch it probably once a year and love it. I also loved Anna Karenina of that time with, um, um, well, it's an, it was another David Lean um, <clears throat> direct, directorial. I, do, I love David Lean, any of his work. The third one, I can't really think. I'm just running through all the movies I've seen. There will be blood, possibly. Oh, such a great movie. Uh, yeah, that's such a great movie. Yes. Daniel Danis. Oh, Paul Thomas Anderson. Oh, just <laughs> Paul Dano. Just amazing. Now, are there any projects that you would would aim someone interested in costume design to look at? Are there any films that you can go, oh, if you want to get into, I know it's a tough question. I know she just made, she, for anyone just listening, she just gave me a look. Uh, <laughs> is there anything that pops to the top of your head? You're like, you know what? These these two or three movies are really great, but there's a thousand of them out there. But the things that maybe sink to you personally. Well, um, it's very, very hard. I have to say that's why I was, I was giving you the look of what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? There's so much out there. I sure. really don't think, off the top of my head, I could pick anything to oh, yeah. say, watch this and learn. Because I think you learn every day from everything you see, um, every film, every movie that you watch. You just you learn, and you know I could. I, I honestly cannot think of three just off the off the cuff like that. I would have to email them to you, <laughs> think long and hard into the night. <laughs> then I go, oh, but then that's not fair on that one, and that's not fair on that one. You know, it's like putting a guest list together for a wedding. Well, if I invite this person, I have to. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And then you've got five hundred people. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm sorry. I'm going to welch out of that one. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Janthi, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been an absolute pleasure and honor speaking to you. And please continue doing the amazing work you're doing uh, with with all with every every project you work with and and uh, and with Ridley because we need we need projects like the ones you're working on out there because it, it, it they're an endangered species in Hollywood. They really are. So thank you so much for the work you do. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I've so enjoyed it. And really, it's all Ridley. It's not me. (laughs) 